Aloha! This is Keakua Aina Food. I started this farm a little over two years ago. Uh, being an avid surfer and somebody who is passionate about the Aina here in Hawaii, I saw that it was only relevant to have a farm where we could grow some food. Being that we live on a fertile, just beautiful place, everybody comes here because it's paradise, right? Well, if it's paradise, you should be able to eat food from the land here. After about six to eight months of living off the Aina, living off the land, building my own little cabin, and you know, living super close to the soil, I started getting really, really sick. And at first it was extremely confusing. It didn't make sense. But uh, when I took a couple steps back from the project and I questioned you know, the environment, I questioned the area, it all became very, very clear. Um, I came to realize that I'm basically in a cesspool of chemicals. Um, right up from me, not even a mile away, is um, so much GMO farming. You've got Monsanto, you've got DuPont, you've got Pioneer. I'm basically um, totally boxed in with GMO companies. In the middle of the night, I would wake up wheezing and I'd have these full-on bronchial spasms. And not only was I having this, but also my friends who were staying here were having the same symptoms. And we actually have a river um, over here in this direction that runs through the property. And that river also goes through Monsanto land, um, which is right up the hill and all those chemicals when it rains seep into the river and that river occasionally does flood after really really heavy rains and when it floods it just smells like really strong chemicals just putrid mud it's it's just awful the area is right across the street from breakers there's there's a little community there's quite a few quonset huts in that area and it's right next door to a piece of land that kamehameha schools is renting out to monsanto and you literally have um, less than a block away, you have houses and you have families and you have people trying to live their lives. I met one man who said, he told me that whenever these guys would spray, he would, uh, him and his whole family would get super, super sick. And he told me that, um, you know, they, they were developing all kinds of illnesses. After pouring out blood, sweat, and tears on the land here, I realized uh, it was, it wasn't worth it. I mean, there's no way that I can live naturally and live off the land and grow good food if I'm on a piece of land that is totally toxic. So about four or five months ago, I um, fully disconnected from the project and stepped away from it. Everywhere you go around the world, you know, that place that you go to has its resources. Our resource, you know, one of the main resources we have is the ocean, the clean water and the reefs and the fish. That lifestyle is what Hawaii is pretty much built around. The way that these companies work is they take the most valuable land around the world and they turn it into a wasteland. And that's what they're doing here in Hawaii. GMO is in the same sense to allow this kind of practice to be experimented here in Hawaii. And then they go out and commercialize it, saying that in beautiful Hawaii, we are raising these fields of corn or these fields of whatever it is, testing and we are convinced that it is appropriate for the rest of the world to eat. Using Hawaii as, as the wedge into the markets in the rest of the world is a crime. And we need to stop that. We need to say we object to it and we need to put up a defense for it. Why is a global center for the field testing of genetically modified crops? Uh, this means that in Hawaii they do improvement trials, variety trials, and they select the best seed which they're going to send to other parts of the world for sale to farmers. Genetic engineering, in simple terms, is introducing genetic information from one species to another species. Uh, so this could be uh, from tomato to corn, it can be from fish to corn or tomatoes, uh, from one animal to another. We can basically cross any species barriers. And this is not something that occurs in nature. Nature has purposely created barriers to prevent genetic information to transfer from one species to another. And it has done this for a purpose, uh, to prevent uh, that kind of cross-mixing, which may create undesirable organisms. One of the two major modified crops are the Roundup resistant crops. Uh, 
when you spray herbicides on Roundup resistant crops, supposedly all the weeds die and the corn survives. Today, only about six crops are genetically modified, uh, such as corn, soybean, cotton, and so on. Uh, so some people say, well, why should we, you worry about it if that, those are the only crops that are modified? But if you look at their planning documents, at what I have articulated in the past, these companies actually want to genetically modify most of the commercial crops grown out there. Uh, so that means that down the road, uh, all vegetables and all fruit crops would be genetically modified. And H Hawaii was the first example when they released uh, the genetically modified papaya. And when you look at the planning documents from those days, from the early 90s, uh, the companies were saying, in 10 years, 15 years, all of the crops are going to be modified. And if you go to India, you see that they are trying to release the genetically modified eggplant, uh, other, other vegetable crops. of the community of Waimea in Kauai uh, filed a, a legal complaint uh, against a pioneer or DuPont in, in the island of Kauai claiming over the past 12 years uh, a level of uh, dust escape and uh, pesticide drift into their communities from GMO fields. I took a look at some of the pesticides uh, listed on the complaint and some of the pesticides that are used by the uh, GM seed company in Hawaii uh, just to take an evaluation about uh, what are the uh, potential risks to environmental and human health. And uh, I list in the report that I summarized about 28 pesticides, but in fact this is just uh, a small portion of the amount, total amount of pesticides used by the seed industry. Uh, the number of pesticides could be, well, t twice or, or, or more than the, than, than the ones I, I listed. And I did so because we should realize that the use of pesticides is an integral part of the production of genetically modified crops. In the report, I, I do indicate that there's uh, several concerns about some of the pesticides that I list, such as the use of atrazine, uh, which is produced by Syngenta, uh, the use of Lorsman, uh, which is a, a product that has been banned in, in, in other countries, but continues to be used in the United States. Another feature is that these pesticides don't just act alone, they act in combination. When they act in combination, they basically become another drug or another chemical, a different toxin. And we have little understanding about the long-term effect of these combinations, both on human health and on the environment. After three or four years of use, you need a new pesticide because the pests have developed resistance. Uh, to this uh, product. So it's like a never-ending bottle. Uh, and this is why industrial agriculture has come under so much criticism because it consists of more toxics. And while we may be able to get a crop, uh, the community is getting exposed to a range of pesticides. The State of Hawaii Department of Health in December 2006 created a 172-page report entitled Environmental Response and Hawaii Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know. Between 1967 and 1968, the University of Hawaii in collaboration with Department of the Army, Fort Detrick, Frederick, Maryland, 
conducted experiments to assess the defoliation effects of various pesticides, including Agent Orange, on jungle vegetation in Kauai. These were aerial spraying experiments. Today, Agent Orange still affects descendants of those directly poisoned when they were exposed by aerial applications. As for the company's early history, the decades when it grew into an industrial powerhouse are now held potentially responsible for more than 50 Environmental Protection Agency Superfund sites. Dow Chemical Company, 1977, Accidental Spill, 495 gallons of the soil fumigant EDB occurred about 60 feet from the Kunia Well in Oahu. DuPont, parent of Pioneer Seed, major GM seed company in Hawaii, and Ben Late. During the 1990s, hundreds of farmers and greenhouse operators throughout the world claimed several health side effects from the use and exposure to the fungicide Ben Late. Because the circuit court found that DuPont had engaged in serious discovery violations, it imposed sanctions of $1.5 million payable to the state of Hawaii. Good afternoon and welcome to downtown Haleiwa on the North Shore of Oahu. My name is Carter Allen. I'm a resident of the North Shore for almost 40 years. I'm involved in the natural and organic foods industry and I'm here to share with you today about the uh, agricultural community that we live around here on the North Shore uh, owned by Kamehameha Schools and uh, as we have moved from being a, a a uh, hundred year old sugarcane society. We've moved into a new technology here on the North Shore run by the biotech uh, industry, Monsanto and all of their affiliates, uh, growing bio, uh, biotech foods here on the North Shore. Uh, we're not sure whether it's for animal or human consumption. We're not really sure what it's for because they're very quiet about what they're doing. The Oahu land ownership map shows miles of land owned by Monsanto in Kunia. The satellite map of Kunia shows GMO monoculture crops. A satellite map of the North Shore shows thousands of acres of GMO crops. Some of the most aggressively farmed industrial agriculture is Kamehameha-owned land. There are two major farm groups here in Hawaii. One of them is the Farm Bureau. There are about 1,800 members. We're a smaller organization, only about 400 members. What's the difference between us? Well, if you go to their webpage, you find out they totally endorse GMO. They see it as a wave of the future of employment and prosperity. On the other hand, Farmers Union, my folks, think it's pretty much the devil's work. We don't want to have anything to do with it. We tend to be organic, or at least not GMO. These corporations that are being subsidized by the federal government that are leasing Hawaiian sacred lands and doing these what are essentially deadly practices for the, in the justification of feeding the masses, right? Are they responsible legally? Organic farmers are in a very difficult position when it comes to enforcing their rights to farm organically and um, to protect their crops, their organic crops, from um, not only pollination from GMO crops, but also the impacts of the pesticide drift on their organic certification and on their own health. Farmers may be able to file lawsuits alleging nuisance by neighboring property owners who are using these pesticides, but those are often long, drawn-out legal battles. The so-called legal system is ineffective. And it's not only with GMOs, just the way oil companies, uh, Bhopal for example, having poisoned the people in India and then escaping and then ending up many years later paying pittance. 
for that kind of uh, destruction. The state and county's uh, lack of enforcement and to some degree inability to enforce the laws and regulations we do have to regulate pesticide application. The State Department of Agriculture, for instance, that is the state agency that's responsible for enforcing our pesticide regulations. There is only one inspector for the entire island of Oahu. These uh, oil-based chemical pesticides, herbicides, uh, they don't just disappear. They go out into the ground and then when it rains they run off into the streams and then as they run off into the streams they run off into the oceans. If you look at their product line, they want to create a market for their pesticides. So what they did is they altered food so that the food can resist the pesticides, so it justifies the spraying of the pesticides. Dean Nakamoto, the president of the Farm Bureau, likes to say we owe a great debt to the GMO people because them being here, they're importing so much chemicals, bulk of chemicals into the, to the state that they have lowered the cost of chemicals for other farmers. Do you see the powder in there? So not only are the GMO people using more chemicals on the, on the ground, but they have made it such that all of our other farmers can now afford to buy cheaper chemicals. But when I was up there checking out um, these guys' operation, I noticed that the workers were in complete spacesuits. It looked like these guys were preparing to, you know, blast off to the moon. These guys had recovered head, head to toe, had gloves on, had full on respirator, full on head covering, big boots, full on white suit and these guys are just dousing the land with these chemicals and then you've got me and a couple of my friends you know about a mile down the road in the lowlands you know just got done catching a morning surf session we're in our board shorts barefoot trying to grow some good food for for ourselves and for the community and it's it's no wonder why we were getting sick. There's a lot of people over in the Wailua area that are concerned about what's going on up there. They've seen uh, situations going on at night where there's lights up in the fields, where they have armed guards not letting people coming up there, and where there's people up there in spacesuits uh, spraying, spraying and doing all kinds of things. And uh, basically we're just living in a situation where we really don't know what's going on. We went under and they were growing asparagus. And the asparagus. Lots of asparagus. Yeah. About 10 were, acres of asparagus. Lots and lots of it. And they were showing us the, the issues that they were having because right next door, like right across the driveway, was GMO, GMO. corn. Yeah. And they were being so affected by the chemicals that comes over and the um, sprays that they're using. And there's no way to protect themselves yeah. out there. And then when you're standing there and you see the spray truck coming, and the guy's wearing rubber gloves, duct tape sleeve, he's in a full body suit, he's got a hat on, it looks like a hazmat thing, like when the anti-terrorist guys come in. When big companies, you know, put such a great emphasis on just making money at all costs and not considering the people who live, you know, in that area or, or just, you know, the, the environment, it's, it's totally wrong. I mean, you have to, you know, you, yeah, you want to feed people, you want to, you know, the, I'm sure these people have kids too, but you, you cannot do it, do what you have to do to survive at all costs, at the cost of the environment, at the cost of people's health. I think, I think that's, that's wrong. The great thing about being a human being is, is uh, we have choices. We can, do, you know, pretty much shape our own destiny, you know what I mean? And, and, and do things the way we want to do them. So this is a choice. The, the, you know, the poisons, all this stuff, the way they're doing things is a conscious choice by this company, it, you know, to, to do what they have to do to make money. The culture was centered around nature, it was centered around a responsible relationship to nature. Look at the phrase, people say, oh, the life of the land is perpetuated through righteousness. That's bull. You know what that really means? It means life is perpetuated through a balanced pono, a balanced relationship with the land. Let me say that again. Life is perpetuated through a balanced relationship with the land. Do we have a balanced relationship with the land here? 
Or are we at war with the land? Are we at war? That's what we're at. We're at war with the land. We are bombing and bombing to create edibles. I go down to Tripler. I'm breaking out in boils and rashes. They do a blood and urine test. They give me a letter. It says, you have been exposed to Agent Orange. You're suffering from Agent Orange. You're going to suffer the following diseases. And they give this way too long of a list. I have Agent Orange poisoning. And what is it doing? It's hitting the Vietnam veterans that are over 50 years old. Monsanto, do I take it personal? You bet I do. Monsanto, you will be held responsible for what you have done to the land. And if you're wise, you would make reparations now and stop what you're doing because we don't want any part in it. We have a choice. And what you are doing is experimenting with our food supply and our land and our water and our air. And it has to stop now. Waialua High School is hundreds of yards away from a DuPont Pioneer seed corn processing facility and over a thousand acres of GMO corn. On Oahu, between Haleiwa Town and Haleiwa Elementary School, there are hundreds of acres of corn on land owned by Kamehameha. One hundred years ago, the north shore of Oahu was one of the most fertile places in the world to grow food. A view of the Oahu land ownership map shows that the highest concentration of excessively farmed monoculture agriculture is Kamehameha land. The north shore has among the highest concentrations of former sugar and pineapple plantations that use toxic chemicals for a century. This land has never been cleaned up or remediated and still contaminates aquifers and the water supply. A lot of this land is owned by Kamehameha. Uh, many years ago when they first came into this community and a lot of people in the Chamber of Commerce were very excited about the biotech industry coming in and I had to bite my tongue uh, because I was already aware of what was going on. I was already aware that they were using Roundup uh, in uh, Roundup Ready corn, you know, inserting that gene into the corn. The fields have basically have to be sterile. Uh, and when the fields are sterile, there has to be zero levels of weeds and zero levels of uh, foreign insects that can feed on the crop so that when they harvest the seed, that, that seed is clean and they can send it over to their warehouse in Iowa. Uh, so to maintain a clean seed, they need to work the fields extensively. They need to apply a lot of herbicides, chemical herbicides, to maintain the fields clean and they need to make multiple applications of pesticides, uh, sometimes even eight out of nine or 10 days of the year in their fields. Uh, so the amount of pesticides and field work that they conduct in, for seed crop production is way higher than traditional farmers in the state. Plantation agriculture produce a lot of crops, but at the same time, it cost a lot of uh, pollution in terms of the pesticides and chemicals that they use to grow those crops. Uh, a referee study came out showing that we, if we take into, into account the social cost of fixing all the pollution and health aspects from the plantation agriculture, plantation ag would not have been a profitable enterprise. I go to the church of Don Huber. Don Huber is a uh, retired professor from Purdue University. He is previously, I believe, he was a rank of colonel in the Army in uh, biological warfare. What he talks of, his specialty in life, is examining soil. And it's all the micro life that is in the soil. And what he came up to finding out is that these, the chemical that is in Roundup, what it does, it impairs the ability of a plant to be able to process the nutrients. What they happened is, and he wrote a letter that got published uh, about the alfalfa going off, is they found out if they took this alfalfa and they put it in different mixtures of soil and they sprayed it with Roundup, everything died unless it was Roundup ready. But the odd thing was, and they documented it, and the experiment's been repeated, is they took the alfalfa or other Roundup ready crops, if they put them in sterile soil, they didn't die. 
What it turned out to be was that the chemicals in the Roundup Ready, what it does is attack the immune system of the plant. GMO crops use a large amount of precious water resources and drain natural resources. Due to genetic drift and GMO pesticide contamination, chemicals leak into our water sources, reach non-target areas, and pollute Hawaii. Kamehameha Schools was founded in 1887 by the will of Bernice Pawahi Bishop, great-granddaughter and last royal descendant of Kamehameha the Great. The mission of Kamehameha Schools is to fulfill Pawahi's desire to provide educational opportunities in perpetuity to improve the capability and well-being of people of Hawaiian ancestry. Today, Kamehameha is one of the largest private trusts in the world. Kamehameha Schools serves more learners and sees a 20.5% one-year total return as the fair market value of the endowment rises to $9.06 billion as of June 30, 2011. This endowment is in addition to land holdings of 363,367 acres, including 213,269 acres of agriculture land and 145,032 acres of conservation land. The Kamehameha Schools Endowment includes considerable Wall Street investments, including $2,122,000,000 of marketable debt and equity securities, plus $4 billion of hedge funds, private equity funds, and commingled funds. Almost all of the investment portfolio is invested outside of Hawaii with Wall Street bankers and investment managers. A very small amount of this money has been used to support the future of Hawaii and invested in local agriculture. An environmental and social audit of this $9 billion, $60 million investment portfolio has never been done to determine which companies in their portfolio are threatening the future of the islands of Hawaii. Kamehameha has a record of supporting sustainable and organic agriculture in many ways. Currently, it leases land for fish ponds and some organic farming. However, to identify what portion of their lands are being devoted towards sustainability, Kamehameha should provide an account of the total land acreage devoted to organic farming and for local food production on Kamehameha land. Currently, according to the Department of Agriculture, Oahu has less than 100 acres under organic production, and only a small portion of these are Kamehameha lands. Today, Kamehameha rents over a thousand acres of land for GMO experimental trials, GMO seed corn, and GMO papaya operations. Kamehameha's current agriculture land management practices are in direct opposition to their planning policy statement. Kamehameha schools will malama ikaaina practice ethical, prudent, and culturally appropriate stewardship of land and resources. Page 1 of the Kamehameha North Shore Plan clearly states the goal that agricultural lands are preserved and provide foods and energy. All public planning documents from Kamehameha only discuss local farming, stewardship, and sustainability. The planning documents from Kamehameha do not discuss chemical or GMO farming, nor their leases. Many community members and parents are still unaware about the nature of nearby farming operations. Kamehameha has not informed the public that they are living in the proximity to GMO chemical agriculture. Kamehameha schools should notify the community that Monsanto uh, is leasing their land and that it's right up the way from the communities of people who are raising their children, who are living their lives, it's really, uh, it's, it's basic humanity. What would Bernice Pawahi Bishop do? We talk about managing this multi-billion dollar trust that is supposedly to be in service of Hawaiians. 
tell me how Hawaiians are benefiting. Is it because the money generated through poisoning the land is going to their education? Is that what you call managing resource? That is not pono. At some point in our lives, we have to decide we're only going to live for so long. Are we in service or are we completely out of touch with pono? The bishop estate and all of the money generated, does it come through a conscious relationship with society, through land? Kamehameha schools um, do, do what's right. You know, if you know what Monsanto is doing, stop them. If you don't, find out and, and, you know, either way, get them out of there. Get a bunch of local farmers that care about the people here, care about the community and what we eat. The, you know, people that care about our kids, care about our reefs, care about the future of Hawaii. If uh, Kamehameha Schools does not evict Monsanto and other similar companies, they may be held legally liable for the contamination to the environment and the impacts on surrounding property owners and s small farmers and the community. They certainly could be named in a lawsuit as a defendant, as the landowner. On Kauai, in the recent class action lawsuit by 150 Waimea community members against Pioneer DuPont, the property owner is named as a defendant. The will of Princess Bernice Pauahi Bishop, which created the Kamehameha Trust, states on the last line, I also direct that my said trustees shall have power to determine to what extent said school shall be industrial, mechanical, or agricultural, and also to determine if tuition shall be charged in any case. The princess had the insight to foresee the need for mechanical and agricultural schools. Because local food production is an important issue for Hawaii today, the trustees must consider this early vision by establishing an agricultural academy to preserve Hawaiian agricultural practices and traditions and resilient ahupua'a. Kamehameha Schools helps the estimated 5% of Hawaiians that meet their educational standards. The other 95% of Hawaiians who have not benefited from the trust should be offered the opportunity to be trained to farm and return to their ancestral land that is now controlled by Kamehameha. We need to grow a new generation of farmers, uh, but we need to pro provide them with the technical how of how to go about farming. Uh, so one of the big uh, things that I have been pushing for is the creation of student farms. And I feel that the, some of the large landowners in the state could assist in this way by opening some of their land for student farms. Uh, and this co basically consists of a commercial farm where new farmers can come and work on that farm for a period of six to, um, months to a year to learn how to run tractors, the business of farming, and once they learn the basics of farming, they can move on uh, with their own farming operations. Two years ago, University of Hawaii quit training agriculture teachers. We have no educational path for a student wanting to become an agriculture teacher in high school. It's dead end. They don't do it. What they're training is what the industry wants, and that is basically your clerks and your scientists. Somebody to be a chemist, to work four months on to. We do not have a farm entrepreneurial program to teach the business, you know, how to be a farm, how to get a farm, how to finance a farm, or how to market a farm, or how to stay in business as a farmer. The land leased for GMO crops, formerly used for sugar and pineapple, haven't been properly tested to determine the level of chemical residue in the soil. If any of this land has been contaminated with chemicals, such as arsenic, it must first be remediated. I think it would be a great idea if uh, 1,000 acres or 10,000 acres or whatever it is was opened for small-scale production. But it has to be a, a well-designed uh, plan. It just doesn't happen by, the, by default. Uh, you have to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. And this includes infrastructure, uh, capital assistance to farmers, uh, education, technical training. When you want to farm sustainably 
or organically in a new location, one of the first steps that you take is to learn from the experience of indigenous populations. And in Hawaii, we have the great model of the Ahupua system. Uh, the Ahupua system is a system of land management, and it's Ahupua or watershed management system. And it tells us about how the wisdom of the experience of the Hawaiian people uh, they, they used to properly manage agricultural systems for a period of hundreds and almost 2,000 years. Uh, so here, this is a, a, a quick diagram that explains how they developed an integrated system where there was a biodiversity and where they were ma maximizing efficiency in, and the recycling of nutrients and energy within the system. Uh, so we can see that in the upper areas, uh, the higher elevations, uh, they had upland crops such as sweet potato and upland taro, dryland taro. Uh, they were fishing ar along the stream using the water resources. And in the lower levels of the uh, watershed of Ahupua, uh, we have the lois. Uh, so the nutrients were reaching the taro fields, the, the paddy taro fields. And in the outer ranges, in the ocean side, you had the fish ponds. Uh, so they have an extensive diet composed of high carbohydrates from the taro and sweet potato fields and the high protein diet uh, from the fish that they were picking from the uh, ahupua. So when we think about the future of agriculture in the state, the idea is how can we develop models that mimic this type of sustainable, resilient systems. Uh, and this is almost totally opposed to the concept of clearing extensive areas of land to plant mono, uh, monocultural crops. Uh, this is maintaining biodiversity, ecological resilience, and this is what we should be striving for in terms of small-scale agriculture in Hawaii. To expand the organic farming movement on Hawaii, Kamehameha could create a fund to offer low interest rate loans to the farmers to invest in the land, to dig wells, buy equipment, establish distribution relationships, and hire employees. Farmers need assistance to get started because it takes three to five years before a farm can turn a profit. Young farmers do not have the needed capital to start a farm. I think Kamehameha Schools, uh, as a big landowner that's out here, um, you know, I mean, they do have a responsibility and they, sh you know, hopefully will be thinking not just in the short term. I mean, they always say that with um, businesses, you know, they have the board of directors and, you know, trying to maximize their revenues or returns. But I mean, obviously, as a Hawaiian culturally based school and organization, they got to be thinking of the Hawaiian values. Um, and that, of course, means caring for the land and, and honoring that connection with the land. It would be amazing if Kamehameha Schools would be able to um, use some of the assets that they have to be able to create a fund to um, support the next generation of Hawaiian farmers. I mean, there's a lot of um, Hawaiian youth that when they come out here, they love to be connected to the land and um, I mean, there's a lot of cultural connections to the land. Kamehameha should invest in the health of their students by providing them with non-GMO food, consisting mostly of local wholesome organic meals for their school lunches. If this is not possible, Kamehameha should inform its teachers, students, and parents that their meals contain GMO ingredients. In terms of dealing with all the GMO growth that is here in Hawaii is just getting the GMO food labeled. Those people who want to eat GMO, it can be properly labeled so those people who support GMO can eat that food and uh, integrate that into their daily diet and those people who don't want to eat GMO can know by so that when they see it on the shelf it is properly labeled. Many people don't fully appreciate the control of the seed of, of our world because in seeds is the future, just like in our children is the future of our, our people. Kamehameha Schools evict Monsanto. Kamehameha Schools evict Monsanto. Kamehameha Schools' whole purpose in life is to improve the well-being of the Hawaiian people 
And so it behooves us to get out to the community and figure out ways that we can support the quality of education in the communities as well as on our campuses.